EU4 1.34 is around the corner and there are some changes in the upcoming patch that will completely change the meta. I'm talking about new estates meta, I'm talking about new AI features and as well as new starting nations like Gotland over here. That's right, with 1.34 Gotland starts out as an independent country instead of just a small rebellion a part of the Danish crown. Also just putting it out there, this is probably one of my favorite colors in the upcoming DLC. So they start with a little bit of history as always they mention how the province was basically occupied by a rebel stack in 1.33 now it's changed and Gotland is a starting nation with Eric as its a ruler Eric of Pomerania that is the importance of the Visby province overall is much higher now in the next update Gotland was a part of the Hansa as they mentioned here the hideout of the ex-king Eric and a base of operation for Eric's piracy which is why as you imagine Gotland is is gonna be very easily the best pirate republic in the game since it has access to the richest nodes from the very beginning. So you have two options at the start. You can either choose to go with the monarchy missions or the pirate missions. Essentially you can either become the Danes eventually if you go with the monarchy trying to reclaim Eric's uh, legacy and reclaim Eric's uh, right to the Danish throne or you can just become a snappy duple do a republican pirate over here by saying that Eric is just the mayor of Gotland and not the king of Denmark. If you go down the Republican path, you have two options again. You can become a plutocracy or you can become a pirate republic, which obviously is the best choice here. And you also get some galleys and some light ships if you do choose to become either of these. The starting missions are fairly easy to do from what I can deduct here, giving the option to eventually get back in control of the Danish crown and as such the Kalmar Union. So the monarchy missions of Gotland are a little bit shorter, but they will help you with your ambitions. You get 10k manpower per nation which has the same dynasty as you and has a hundred opinion of you once you have the uh, dynastic relations mission done that easily means you can get 30,000 manpower from the start as long as you just improve some relations or actually 20,000 because that's only two Pomeranian nations not three a deal with the Emperor lets you ask Austria for monetary support and this is what it looks like from the Austrian side you get 500 ducats as Gotland as well as a lot of other goodies including yearly tax income, maintenance reduction, advisor cost reduction. This is absolutely amazing. It actually gives you a chance of uh, claiming back your throne, essentially. Take note, though, if you ever take back Holstein and Schleswig and you got support from the Emperor, then you kind of have to return these uh, back to the Empire. You got to give them back or you can choose to hold on to them. But that's obviously going to have some repercussions. Essentially, the Austrians will declare war on you if you do not release uh, Schleswig Holstein. So, yeah, this is a bit of a no brainer unless you're strong enough you want to give that back to the Austrian sir and you can take it back after I guess you know here's something that's definitely gonna change the MP scene and not only it's gonna definitely change a lot of scenes in the northern parts of Europe this mission here well these two missions here restoration of Norwegian and Swedish loyalty essentially make them very disloyal towards their Danish overlords making it easier to get their independence and that obviously means making it easier for you to eventually get them as your PUs swiping them over from the Danish. Take over Shailan mission is really easy to do. You just have to occupy Shailan and this also gives a massive amount of liberty desire to the uh, subjects of the Danes as well as it gives you two stability and lowers your war exhaustion. That's pretty strong. And if you manage to get 50 war score against the Danes, control their capital and be at war with them for three years, you can do execute the wrong king, which makes Denmark a junior partner of yours. You get a white piece with them as well and you get your government changed to a kingdom as well as uh, they get minus 100 liberty desire. Imagine a small little nation of Gotland can get a PU over the Danes, which also means you get the PU over Norway and Sweden at the same time. And the best part, you don't even need to win the war, you just have to hang in there for three years and get the capital. Then the last mission back in control lets you inherit Denmark and Danish becomes the primary culture, as well as you get minus 200 liberty desire for Sweden and Norway, and you get a nice uh, modifier until the end of the game as well with plus one admin skill. Wow, that's really good actually. And you get the Kalmar Union. Essentially, you become Denmark and you inherit their missions. If you don't want to be a monarchy and you really just want to LARP as a republic, then you get this mission tree here. It's completely different from the monarchy mission tree and it's quite decent. It offers some insane modifiers like uh, boosts up your guilds and until the end of the game, you can get either discipline plus five, trade efficiency plus 25, which is amazing as well, or dev cost minus 15%, which is absolutely 
absolutely insane because it means Gotland's gonna be the best playing Toll Nation if this is a global modifier. Now, the third option, of course, the pirate mission tree. So remember, we got three mission trees here. The pirate one, in case Eric decides to go full on rampage mode, is the most fun for sure. And pretty much all of these missions here revolve around piracy, looting, and raiding, basically. <laughs> the most pirate focused tree I've ever seen in any EU4 mission tree so far. And apparently, if it's AI, Gotland will always take the pirate missions as historically Eric was living the pirate life on Gotland until he died. Okay, that's interesting to know. So that means it's gonna be a little bit more difficult unless Denmark kills off Gotland early on. Then uh, if they don't do that, Gotland's gonna ravage the Baltic coastline. Imagine that with this mission tree, you can inherit Cuba and Havana is gonna become the new capital. Oh my god, what is this, man? You also can get art of insults until the end of the game, 10% morale of armies and navies, and a level 2 trade center in Tortuga. Jesus, mother of god, these are absolutely legendary, man. Oh, you get the legendary pirate, the Eric, which means that it does not cost Republican tradition to re-elect, and you can get devastation in Venice. What? Oh, this is from raiding the Venetian arsenal. Oh my lord, this is insane, this mission tree. There's a lot of modifiers that you're gonna get from the missions, of course. Do take note, though, this is not an expanding mission tree the expanding one is the first one for the monarchy so if you go pirate you're gonna have fun but you're gonna stay small and annoying to everybody around you this is what the legendary pirate new trade gives by the way a yearly naval tradition dk minus one leader shock guaranteed and privateer efficiency that's actually really great not gonna lie because you can stack up a lot of privateer efficiency and get a lot of money from privateering the nodes then pirate republics also get some new reforms now and i'm gonna show you some of the highlights like uh, the privateer way over here that offers morale of armies, navies, and so on. Religious freedom offers dev cost reduction. There's a ton of these really absolutely well done and very different from uh, each other One of my personal favorites is though the unified piratical confederacy that offers state governing cost minus 50% Which offsets the tier 1 reform so essentially as a pirate you can be as big as any other regular nation with this reform Once you enact it, but this is a tier 12 reform because now you go up to tier 12 with reforms So it's gonna take a while to get there. We also got new boarding doctrines for the Venetians and a lot of other nations around the world. I'm glad to see that they decided to use that feature a lot more because before there were so few unique boarding policies that it was really a waste of a great feature. And now let's talk about the juicy part. That's right, we're talking about the new Finnish mission tree and the Lubeck mission tree, but most importantly we're talking about the estate changes which will really revolutionize the game entirely and change a lot of videos. I'm gonna have to redo pretty much all of my videos because of it and speaking of guys if you enjoyed the content in general consider subscribing that simple click really helps me out a lot more than you can imagine I would really appreciate it and it would really encourage me to make more videos like these in the future so to briefly go over the Finnish mission tree they focus a lot on the Hapa Piki Piki cavalry that the Finnish have and how strong they were small mission tree since it's a releasable nation most of these bonuses essentially restricted to certain provinces and are temporary bonuses like the uh, savage tactics that offer movement speed and morale damage. The Hapa Piki Piki do not cost any army professionalism when you recruit them as a mercenary company. And there are some interesting modifiers like the core creation cost minus 20% and monthly military power plus one. Until the death of your leader is pretty great but it's uh, temporary until the death of the dude so um, you're gonna have to enact that whenever you see it as the best opportunity of course. Like I was saying before a lot of these basically just affect provinces, rename Stockholm to Tukholm and give out some dev. They're not bad overall, but I honestly don't think anyone's really going to be playing as Finland, except the 0.01% of Finnish people that actually play U4. Cool part is that you can get a university in Abo before you can build university, so that can make a bit of a difference. And the white death upon Europe, until the end of the game, you get attrition plus 2 for enemies. But because attrition is capped as at plus 5, attrition plus 2 is not going to do anything. Because of the terrain and the weather that you have in the Finnish lands, it really is already going to be capped at 5. So 
the plus two attrition for enemies is going to be irrelevant in my opinion. However, I think that they're going to change this and they're going to increase it to plus one maximum attrition as well, which would make a big difference in that case. That definitely would help out a lot. Then you also get combat bonus and terrain capital. That is actually super good, especially since this is until the end of the game. So if you enact this in the first age, you can get plus two combat bonus and terrain of capital early on in the game. And la creme de la creme, my boys, the Lubeck mission tree. If you guys don't know, the Flavor Universalis uh, mod for EU4. This is the mission tree from Flavor Universalis. They implemented this mission tree, changed it a little bit here and there, and I have to say this is a super great mission tree. Really well done, really well balanced, very intricate, and it doesn't seem repetitive like the old mission tree. Quite the opposite, you're really excited to always discover something new about it. So, for example, Young Men of Lubeck scales according to the size of your trade league. That means depending on how many nations you have in the trade league, and it gives you permanent claims on certain areas, as well as a temporary bonus of uh, manpower for 10 years. Gateway to the East will require you to have uh, Riga to be a part of the trade league and have high opinion of you, and then they will become a part of the HRE, which means that it's going to be harder for nations around them to kill Riga. Same goes for Visby, you get a special event, the Hanseatic Town of Visby that you can see here, where Gotland gets, until the end of the game, construction cost reduction and trade power, and every member of the trade league gets a hundred ducats, so you want to be a part of that trade league when that happens. Whenever the Danzig Confederation triggers, you can also go down a path that allows them to get closer to the Hanseatic League, if you know what I mean, or you can just ignore it completely. You have both of these options here. You can also get a shipyard for free in Lubeck, as well as every member of the trade league gains the same rewards. Town Hall of Lubeck is also pretty good. It gives you for a limited amount of time advisor cost reduction and reform progress growth, which is quite good in the recent patch because there's a lot of new reforms reforms now happening and you want to get that reform progress growth. In fact, I hope they add more reform progress growth modifiers to the game to improve the amount of reform points that you get. There's really so many different modifiers and so many amazing rewards that you get from this mission tree like uh, prosperity in provinces, depletion chance modifier reduction until the end of the game and just a lot of dynamic rewards as they're called. And I highly encourage you guys to check out the flavor universalis mod which has this mission tree or Already. It's a little bit different, but you're definitely gonna love it and you can see what 1.34 is gonna be like because you can play with this particular mission tree using that particular mod. You'll find the link to it in the description by the way. Whenever you form the Hanseatic League, you get new ideas now as Lubeck and these ideas are trade efficiency plus 20, one extra merchant, trade steering plus 20%, global trade power plus 15%, ship trade power plus 25%, discipline plus 5%, dev cost minus 5% and goods produced plus 10 Oh my god, this is actually really really strong idea cost minus 10% as well and province trade power modifier plus 20% when it comes to trade nations the Hanseatic League is gonna be the ultimate trade nation in 1.34 hands down even better than Venice with these ideas and here's the juicy part boyos here's the thing that I personally live for we're getting a revamp for the estates so you're gonna start hearing me talk about the estates a little bit more in future videos my boys I know you love them I know you love them first you'll probably notice that we can have six privileges per estate now. Remember, this can be changed. You never know what the final product's gonna look like. But aside from that, we get a new UI. The fact that we have six privilege slots is legendary, guys. It means we can give out so many amazing privileges that we could not give out before simply because we were restricted by the amount of slots that we had. And this will totally change how the estates meta is. Then to finish it off, they basically also show off some of the uh, new reforms that Theocracy have. Some of the old reforms have been revamped and some new ones have also been added. I'll skim through these very quickly. The advisor cost minus 15% isn't really great as well as the average monarch lifespan is amazing too because you can stack this up if you're playing a specific nation that likes to go on crusades and you can have average monarch lifespan almost at plus 60% if you also include the monuments as well. Education of the Theocrat by the way which is the second reform that gives you the advisor cost reduction lets you trigger an event that lets you pick one stat bonus for your heir. So for example here you can choose plus one military diplo or admin points for your heir which I find really interesting as well as until the end of the dude you get free policies based on whatever you go for. The Kingdom of God reform for the Papal States is a third tier reform now and it has received some buffs including morale of armies, cardinal cost reduction 30%, admin skill guarantee plus two. You 
also get culture conversion cost reduction for all of you uh, one culture enjoyers out there. And even some tech cost reduction modifiers with the uh, tier 8 reform. But still, I'd say morale of armies or dev cost reduction based on whatever you want to go for is better for tier 8. And for tier 11, we got manpower in same culture group provinces plus 10% and manpower in accepted culture provinces plus 10. And la creme de la creme of this tier reform is this right here. 50% tax modifier. Tax dev might see a little bit more of a revamp in the uh, next DLC. And this is also something I kind of want to talk about. Aside from the 50% tax modifier that we see here, there's also other modifiers that involve getting more manpower and more tax from having churches, which is telling me that PDX is definitely trying to make it so that tax is not such a bad source of income. And that also means that they're trying to make people go away from the trade production only meta and try to invest in all three sides making tax actually worth it which in 1.33 it's not really worth it as for the ai changes we're gonna find out more about that in the next uh dev diary and i'm personally really looking forward to hear about these if you guys enjoyed the video consider subscribing and until the next time check out this awesome florence video and i want to give a massive thank you to all of my patrons channel members and twitch subscribers i would not be able to do this without all your support